Well, good afternoon, everyone. Thank you so much for being here. It's certainly a privilege to be with our honored guests and this outstanding group of experts uh, who bring a, a wide variety of experiences to the table. Um, I have the pleasure of being the moderator. Now, anyone who knows me, that means I don't get to talk as much. And so I know that'll be hard, Governor. I'll do the best I can. <laughs> Uh, but before I introduce our special guests here today, uh, I'd like to go over the agenda. So just so everyone understands how this process is going to work, because we want to get the most out of our time uh, with the commissioner. Um, we're going to do some brief uh, introductory remarks, and then we'll introduce our special guests who will speak to the group. And so we're very fortunate to have <coughs> FDA Commissioner Dr. Ro uh, Robert Califf, of course, the governor of the great state of West Virginia, uh, Earl Ray Tomlin, of course, uh, Senator Manchin here and so we're going to try to get to the core of the meeting and pose questions of various panel me members just so you know how this is going to work and we have a lot to accomplish over the next few hours um, most of you are aware our state is not immune to the uh, growing issue we have here with substance abuse I mean it's a problem across the nation and uh, we all know the statistics that are very troubling for us I mean we have the highest rate of prescription uh, drugs filled in the United States and the governor has made this a priority in his administration. We're very proud of, of the work that has been done. And under his leadership, our state has really taken a very proactive approach. And I think you'll hear a lot about the work that we've done and we think can be replicated in other states because we're here to share what we've done and what we've accomplished. But also to look at opportunities that, where you can help us and bring more resources into the state of West Virginia. The Governor's Advisory Council on Substance Abuse started in 2011. Many of the members are here and uh, this has been a passion of the Governor and we're proud that you're here and that you'll be able to represent us uh, um, today. This has been a vision for West Virginia and I know that there are a number of critical initiatives that you all will tell everyone about today and so I'm excited to hear that. Um, we know that, that we have uh, dedication and support of everyone around this table, and uh, that really makes, I think, all of us very proud. So the first person I'd like to talk a little bit is our special guest, Dr. Uh, Robert Califf, and he's the top official at the FDA, uh, which is exciting for him to be here in West Virginia. Uh, his bio talks about his uh, focus on strengthening programs and policies, uh, that enable the, uh, the agency to carry out its mission, and their mission is to protect and promote public health. Uh, also, he served as the FDA's Deputy Commissioner for Medical Products and Tobacco from February 15th uh, of 2015 until his appointment as Commissioner in February of 2016. And then prior uh, to joining the FDA, Dr. Califf was a professor of medicine and vice chancellor for the clinical and translational research at Duke University. And he also served as the director of Duke Translational Medicine Institute and founding director of the Duke Clinical Research uh, Institute. He's a nationally and internationally recognized expert in cardiovascular medicine, health outcomes research, healthcare quality clinical research, and he has actually been part of many uh, landmark clinical trials and is one of the most frequently cited authors in biomedical science with more than 1,200 publications in peer-reviewed literature. And obviously, this is one of his priorities, and we're glad to have him here. So please join me in welcoming Dr. Ro Robert Califf. Karen, I'm going to be brief because I'm here to listen to you, but um, it is great to hear the accent. I'm from South, I'm a South Carolinian and uh, um, spent most of my career at uh, Duke University. Also glad to hear I have a Blue Devil fan sitting next to me uh, here. I still have my season tickets at uh, Cameron Indoor Stadium and enjoy the basketball. But, you know, we're here on a serious issue today and you, you all know that. Um, when I um, decided to make the move from the university to the FDA. Um, it's fair to say that um, I had a lot of broad agenda items I was interested in working with and changing about the FDA. Opioids was not at the top of my list, I think it's fair to say. And, um, as I got there and saw what was happening and heard from certain members of Congress, like one to my right here, it uh, began to take a higher priority. And I've had a you know real chance to immerse myself in the issue at a national level and as I think you all know we announced a, uh, a new action plan at the FDA just not too many months ago published it in a New England Journal to make sure it got out there at least to the medical and policy 
communities and we really I feel like we've been very true to uh, what we said we would do we've been checking off the items as we go along but um, there's nothing that the FDA can do alone that will fix this problem we have to shoulder our part of the load and we intend to do that um, and just a, uh, in, in brief um, so we have things that we're doing and I'm here to learn from you about the things that you think can work and hear your suggestions about what we should do but also, as head of the FDA, I get to sit with the other leaders at Health and Human Services, which includes the NIH and the CDC, SAMHSA, which does a lot of the health services, as you know, and we have a HHS plan, which includes a lot of things beyond what the FDA can do. Um, and then, of course, there's the President's plan, and to top it off, Congress just passed significant legislation, which is adding a, additional authority and money to what can be done. Personally, I think a lot of the major effort that needs to be done now is uh, related to um, education at all levels, um, both of you know, consumers and teachers and people like that, but also doctors. And in fact, we were just over at the medication assisted treatment facility nearby. And I'd say all three of the uh, people who really spoke out who were patients there um, got started, um, you know, with some kind of a pain problem they had going to see a doctor and getting prescribed opioids. And, you know, we had a little discussion about was that the right choice for the doctor to make at that time. I think we got to get better on that. And then finally, um, I would just add, you know, I'm a real believer in research. Um, for the millions of people who are addicted right now, we can't take back the situation that they're in. We have to figure out how to deal with it. And I believe that this part of the country, which is being hit the hardest, we, we made a trip to Tennessee uh, last month, um, we have an opportunity by um, learning from what's working and uh, getting federal money and investing state money in research to help everyone else work their way um, out of this problem. So very interested in hearing what you have, have to say and what your suggestions are. Thank you so much. I appreciate that. Uh, next, would uh, like to introduce uh, the governor. Uh, he has been a leader in uh, the issue facing us with substance abuse, and I'd like for him to make some comments. Governor? All right. Well, that's the quickest Karen's ever been. And he's <laughs> <laughs> good, uh, good afternoon, everyone, and I want to thank you, Secretary Bowling, for that kind and short introduction and for the work that you and all the folks at the Department of Health and human resources do to combat uh, substance abuse and in particular Vicki Jones so we first started down this uh, route uh, about five and a half years ago Vicki was there with me and been there every step of the way and I want to thank Vicki also for for all the hard work and, and determination you have had uh, also to Dr. Califf uh, thank you for being here with us today we certainly appreciate it and yeah, for the shining of the national spotlight on West Virginia's challenges and our serious work to tackle the challenges that we have here. Obviously, it's been nearly a year since the president was here, and uh, I think that, once again, was helpful in bringing the spotlight on the problems that we face, not only in West Virginia, but across the country. And obviously, it's always good to be with my good friend, uh, Senator Manchin, and I want to thank you for your leadership uh, on this critical issue at the federal level. and. I know that Joe and I share the same feelings of doing what we can for the people of the state of West Virginia. You know, fighting the op opioid epidemic has been a priority of mine since I became governor. And over the past few years, I'm proud that we've been able to make progress to reduce substance abuse in our state and to rehabilitate West Virginians. In 2011, as Secretary Bowling mentioned, I established the Governor's Council Advisory Council on Substance Abuse, and many of you around this room have attended each of those meetings and I really appreciate uh, all the work that each of you have done. We started the, the whole program by uh, dividing the state up in, uh, to six regional uh, task forces, Doctor, to basically go in and, and look at what problems we were having. And every single one of the, uh, the regions we went into, they all had substance abuse. But what we found, depending on the part of the state you were in, was in each, uh, each region, the substance that was being abused was somewhat different. For example, here in the Canal Valley, one of the biggest problems we had at the time, 2011, was meth labs. And basically, we were able to address that through legislation, making it harder and harder to get the, the ingredients that needed for the meth labs. 
We haven't stopped it, but we have uh, substantially reduced it. You, know, you go to southern West Virginia, the coal fields where I come from, once again, prescription drugs was the, the number one killer in that part of the state. When we got into our panhandles, the northern and eastern panhandle, lots of street drugs uh, for coming in from uh, uh, Pittsburgh or Baltimore, especially heroin and cocaine. And you know, it's it, it just different from from area to area. And the thing that we determined is, you know, the, there's not one size that fits all for the problems that we're having in the state of West Virginia. So we tried to to uh, focus on what each uh, each of the regions need, and then from those regional task forces, bring it up to the governor's advisory council here, and let them discuss it, and then you know bring that back to me. And that's where we were able to make some real changes in our, in our legislation to uh, be able to help people. I think that probably the, the biggest thing that uh, we did was be able to, to identify the services that were available in and, and, and each of those regions and then listen to our regional task force on what additional uh, resources that we need. Uh, I was very fortunate to have a legislature who agreed to give me about $29 million over the last few years to get these services uh, established in our local communities. And uh, even though we don't have as many as we'd like to have, we're at least double to triple or maybe four times better off than we were five years ago as far as the services were offered. Uh, one of the things I think I'm probably the most proud of, or maybe I should back up just a little bit and, and talk about one other thing first. You know, when I first became governor, it was predicted that you know, by 2011, 2012, we'd have to build a new prison in the state of West Virginia because we had you know, so many people and, and most of the people going in was there because of substance abuse, either selling or breaking the law one way or another. And before we uh, passed the Justice Reinvestment Act and working with our council of state governments, when someone's sentence was up, they said, goodbye, there's a door, and we'll see you later. These folks come out not knowing where they were going to live, how they were going to support themselves. Most of the time, going back to the same environment that they put them in jail to start with, and within six months to a year, they had recommitted, they were recommitted back to one of our penitentiaries. That's where the growth was coming from. But since that time, while the folks are incarcerated, they're now getting uh, 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 the kind of counseling, the kind of help they need to keep them off when we turn them out. Before we go out and turn parole prisoners, we make sure that you know they've had what help they can get behind the walls, and then also know what they're going to do, how they're going to support themselves, where they're going to be staying, you know, and continued support uh, uh, while for the first year that they're out. It's proven pretty successful so far. We don't have enough evidence to say it, it's, it's uh, cured all the problem of recidivism, but at the same time, we're still we're below where we were in 2012 when we started this. So I think that part uh, uh, has worked, uh, and of course, once again, the legislature gave me about $10 million to reinvest in these community programs for those leaving the-, uh, the Governor, the, the if, I, if I could just say, I'm, this is not the FDA's issue, but um, in college, I worked in the work release program mm -hmm. in the South Carolina State right. Penitentiary, and if you don't do something like what you describe, you're just, uh, going to repeat this over and over, so I'm, I'm really glad you're doing this. Thank you. The, uh, the next uh, thing, and we've done a lot of things in addition, and, and thanks to Gaska's uh, 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 help and, and, and recommendations, but I think one of the things that's very worthy of, of mentioning mm -hmm. that we noticed as we traveled in our regions around the state is people didn't know where to turn mm -hmm. for help. Usually the services were not there. And we kicked off last September the uh, 844, it's called Help 4 WB. And basically it's a 24-7 hotline that people can call when they need help because they don't know where to turn. You know, and my thoughts are that, you know, at 2 o'clock in the morning you've reached the end of your line and you can remember and get, you know, get this number and call. You're going to get a live person on the other end of that line that's trained to deal with you in that kind of a crisis situation. They will stay on the phone with you until they make contact with one of the services that we have around the state with another live person. They'll make sure that you got an appointment set up. They'll call you usually within 24 hours to make sure you're okay if they can reach you someplace. They will make sure that you got transportation to and from these services. You know, and, and my thoughts are that that one call may be the last call they make. Mm -hmm. and, and without you know somebody being there to answer the phone, 
we may lose those people and we're losing far too many West Virginians. Yes. So anyhow, to this, at this point, uh, it won't be a year until September. <clears throat> about 4,700 people have used it with nearly 2,000 of them actually getting help that have called in. And it's not only for the person that, uh, you know, that has the, uh, the substance abuse problem, but people that are also very much affected, families, friends, neighbors, you know, your, your workmates and so forth. That, we, uh, that tries to call and get help for one of their friends or family members. I th I've seen so many families you know, that suffered so much, and uh, yeah, I think that this is headed in the right direction. At least it gives people, lets them know that there is help available for West Virginians to help us get through. So with that said, uh, we've made a lot of progress with a lot of people's help around this state, and, and uh, but we have a lot of uh, ground to cover, and uh, we certainly do appreciate you being here today. And, uh, to take away, you know, maybe what we've done and that could help some of our sister states. Thank okay. you, Governor. Thank you, Governor. Our, our champion on the federal level, Senator Manchin, I'll turn it over Let to me you. Just say, I, I want to hear what my friend Governor Tomlin just said, that thank you for coming, Dr. Califf. It really, I think that uh, seeing the front lines and seeing the people who are affected, there's not one of us in the room, I don't think there's one of us, that doesn't have no someone in our immediate family, extended family, or close friends not been affected. It's a silent killer. It's of epidemic proportions, not just in West Virginia, but across the country. Uh, the comments I'm going to make on some things concerning the FDA, I want to make sure that you understand, was before Dr. Caleb came. <laughs> uh, and I think Dr. Hall knows what I'm talking about. We've had some, uh, I, I just had a complete awakening and thinking that once we identify, and I'll, I'll start back, we identified that uh, Vicodin and Lortab were a Schedule three drug and it was brought to my attention, and I was going down southern West Virginia into the coal fields. They were passing them out like M&Ms. It was like candy. Everybody had them. So I'm thinking, how come it's so accessible? Shouldn't that be a Schedule II? Shouldn't all opiates, addictive opiates, be a Schedule II? I go before the advisory, come to your offices up there where you now reside, but it was your predecessor, and I make a presentation, and Dr. Hall made a presentation. It was 19 to 10. It was a slam dunk. We thought, well, that's a three-week turnaround. Three years later. Three years later it took us to get the FDA to finally schedule Vicodin and Lortab to schedule two. Then you start seeing that it's, it starts subsiding the amount of prescriptions. But to add insult to injury at the time they did that, they recommended a drug called Zohydros. You, you, you know, what I'm talking about. He, he'll be able, this is way before him, yeah, way before Dr. Taylor. <laughs> and I, I just went crazy. I went completely insane. I said, how could you do that to us? First of all, your own advisory committee recommended against it overwhelmingly not to bring this drug to the market. It's too potent, too dangerous. But you did it anyway. And the commissioner at that time felt that she justified what she had done, and I thought she was wrong. So I come over the period of time here with the legislation that I'm thinking, if I spoke to the FDA prior to Dr. Caleb, got a very little back and forth, if you will. Uh, and what was, what's the mission? What's their mission statement? What's, what's, what, is, what are they responsible for? Other than saying the drug does exactly what the company says it will do. Does it have an effect on society? Will it destroy families? Will it destroy the economy? I can tell you, as, as Governor uh, Tomlin told you, Talk to any law enforcement around the country. In West Virginia, over 90% of all the crimes are drug-related. 90%. Talk about the economy. We're in a state where less than 50% of the working adults are working. Something's wrong. Most of them have a record. They get a felony for larceny. <coughs> you can't get them a job. So I'm probably as guilty as anybody public office sitting here. 20 years ago, I said, lock them up. They've committed a crime. I didn't understand that addiction was... But it was a health risk. It was, it's basically, a, 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 it needs treatment like any type of ailment. We didn't look at it that way. So now, and, and to bring everything to full circle, my cousin, uh, Michael Alloy, who's a federal magistrate judge, we were talking today, he said, Joe, you know, I, I have to send a lot of people on a daily basis. I send a lot of people. He said, I've never had anyone say, Judge, I'm sorry, we don't have a jail cell or a jail bed or a place to put that person. But he says, if I hear it once, I hear it 10 times a day. Judge, I'm sorry. I know you recommend treatment. We have no treatment places to put in. So a parent almost has to hope 
if they have no other means, that their child gets convicted, gets to go maybe to drug court to get rehabilitated, it's absolutely destroying us who we are as a, as a society. So I've come to full circle on sentencing guidelines. I basically believe very strongly that we should be looking at our sentencing guidelines. If it's non, if it's non uh, violent, if it is uh, non sexual, it's strictly larceny, which it happens to be stealing. They start stealing from the family first. They'll steal from me and you. Then they'll steal from their extended family. Then they'll steal from anybody in the neighborhood or anywhere they can. They usually get a felony on their record. Correct, Matt? So what they end up, now they have no hope. There's no segue. We're looking at legislation now that gives them a, a, gives them a way forward. And basically what is said, if they go to a treatment center, one year they're clean. They become a mentor for another year. They should have a right to petition basically the people who put them away, which is the judge, the court, the, the law enforcement, and say, do, do I warrant basically get my record expunged? Can I get back in society and be productive? You hold that out there and they'll do it. Now the biggest problem we have is treatment centers. So I'm looking at it from the standpoint, and these are things you can comment on because you weren't there when I, when I went on my tirade. <laughs> but you caught some of it, didn't you? <laughs> and it's, it's great because we have a dialogue, and this is what it's really all about. We might have agreements to disagree, but it's been so respectful that we can work through it and look at the pathway for it. I would say this Dr. K has been responsive. He's looking at it. He's trying to change the culture. The culture is it's not, this is a big shift to change. I'm also going to be asking you questions, Doctor, about your, your relationship with the DEA. Because the DEA is responsible for how much is put on the market. We keep thinking it's FDA's responsibility. It's not. DEA, and I don't know how, what we have to do on a federal legislation to mirror these two up so we have more control. But coming down to, to the biggest problem I see, there is no funding source. God bless Governor what he did. I mean, out of a tight budget, he took money out and asked him, okay? Can't continue to do that. You know that. With the budgets we have, they're constrained. We have no federal money set aside at all, at all, to the extent unless we make a big plea. This epidemic is more, uh, is more visible today and more transparent than ever before. And we're going to keep it that way because people are talking now. They're not afraid to tell you, my daughter, I lost my daughter. You heard about Jesse's law that we've introduced on, on David Grubb's daughter, Jesse. It's, it's horrible. That could, be, that could be prevented. It's a very simple piece of legislation. It says that if the patient and the guardians say, hey, I want you to hot pocket my, my child and let us know, uh, doctor, uh, before you do anything, before you discharge her. That's all. I said one final thing. I said, and everybody's concerned how you're going to fund it. How's it going to be funded? So we come up with a piece of legislation. I think, doctor, you're familiar with it. Is that basically we'll put a one penny fee. You can call it a tax, you can call it a fee. If you're a Democrat or Republican, you're afraid you're going to vote for a tax and someone's going to vote you out, I'll guarantee you won't lose a vote if you're a Democrat or a Republican. If you put one penny per opiate that's produced and sold in America, that'll produce one and a half to two billion dollars a year directly into, directly into treatment centers throughout this country that'll give us some place to try to treat a person who's, who's possibly going to lose their life if we don't do something. And I've got, no one's talking against it, they're just afraid to sign on. I've got about 10 co-sponsors right now, I just need my, uh, my colleagues from the other side of the aisle to, to see the wisdom of this and hopefully they understand there won't be a pushback. I ask town meetings everywhere I go, what do you think about it? Democrats and Republicans, they all raise their hand, they say we have no place to put our kids, we need help. So this is a funding, and, and so there'll be, this will be a great, lively conversation. So I just, again, want to say thank you, Doctor. I really appreciate you being here. Uh, Karen, for you all, DHH Harsing, Governor, for uh, your fight every day. It's just, it's just heart-wrenching what we see, what we see and what we hear every day. Thank you, Senator. Um, the way we're going to approach this is we have some questions, and we're going to, I'm going to pose the question to a particular person on the panel. We'll ask you to keep their comments pretty brief so that we can have good dialogue and, and the commission will have the opportunity to really hear for, from as many people as possible uh, in the group. The first question they would like to pose is, what is working well to address this epidemic for patients? And so I'd like Dr. Sullivan, if, if uh, he doesn't mind, to sort of start that conversation off because he's, he's very well versed in what's going on with the patients uh, across West Virginia. So what's working well with the patients? <clears throat> well, the fact that some of them can actually get to treatment is what's working well. That, the, 
I, I need to be careful as I say this because still in West Virginia, the vast majority of patients are not going to find treatment and they're not going to get treatment and, and we have serious workforce issues that I could talk more about. But what works well really is the same thing the President talked about when he was here, it's medication assisted treatment. You know, once people have opioid addiction, it just doesn't miraculously go away. And I think that's what a lot of people thought. You could arrest your way or educate your way or something out of this. But once people have opioid addiction, it just doesn't go away. So we've got all these people in West Virginia need treatment. The good news is, is that we've got treatment called medication assisted treatment. There's medicines out there for that that can really help people get and stay in recovery. Um, they are sadly underused or sometimes terribly misused. Mm -hmm. You go down both roads on that one. But when used correctly, they are game changers, they're life changers. Um, we have a clinic in Morgantown with about 450 patients in it. I've told some people this, we have 450 patients in the clinic, we have 600 on the waiting list, which is ridiculous, and that's in Morgantown, you know, where we got some, where we have lots of treatment. Um, but I think that, you know, the issue is, 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 we've got treatment, we just don't have the capacity to treat patients. I guess it, the point that I want to say is medication-assisted treatment, when used correctly, can change people's lives. And my medical students, I'll just end with this because I know you want to keep them this short. I uh, have medical students always rotate through with me and they're stunned by the fact that number one, addicts look different than they expected them to, number one. Number two, that in fact so many of them are working after they get some recovery under, under them. You know, once they get into treatment, they get a little bit of clean time. So many of them are working and working a lot. They constantly will comment on that. So I would say that what's working, in fact, is we got, you know, we do have treatment out there that will work. We just have to greatly expand it. And uh, Matt, you may want to talk about it from the recovery perspective. First, uh, welcome West Virginia, Dr. Califf. Uh, very happy to have you here. Uh, and I think uh, Dr. Sullivan really uh, uh, explained it well. What we've got to look at is recovery. Uh, once folks go through uh, a facility, and they, whether it's a medicated assisted treatment facility or an abstinence-based facility like we have, a recovery point all across the state of West Virginia, we've got to be able to support those individuals uh, post-discharge from their care. Um, need to integrate them uh, with the local behavioral health facilities so that they can uh, have access to peer support. Um, we've also got to look like Senator Manchin looked at, and that's uh, some type of forgiveness or expungement. Um, with the lowest uh, uh, workforce participation rate in the United States, uh, like was mentioned, um, we have to look how we can get these folks back to work. Uh, and we know from Recovery Point and the graduates that we see, there's a direct correlation between people who stay in recovery uh, with being employed. Um, you lose purpose when you're unable to be uh, gainfully employed. You're unable to pro provide for your family, um, which ultimately people just run back to what they know, and that's that you can make a quick buck by continuing to uh, manufacture or continuing to uh, sell drugs. Uh, I'm a person in long-term recovery and a graduate uh, of Recovery Point. Um, if you looked at me today, you probably wouldn't know that at one point I was homeless living in your community. Uh, and really the folks that Governor Tomlin's Justice Reinvestment Act was, was targeted toward to get those folks off the street and get the help they need. So we're a recipient of the Justice Reinvestment Act and now I get to oversee uh, the facility that ultimately changed my life. I'm from Kentucky and grew up in Kentucky. Uh, West Virginia accepted me and embraced me when Kentucky didn't want me. So I'm forever grateful to the, to the great state of West Virginia, now a resident of West Virginia uh, and a graduate of Marshall University because of recovery. Uh, I can't emphasize that word. I think uh, Commissioner or Secretary Bowling, uh, Kim Walsh, uh, Deputy Commissioner, and, and, and Vicki Jones because they've just been fantastic partners um, in providing these essential services to people all across the state of West Virginia. Well, if I could just make a quick comment. Of First of all, I won't say anything bad about Kentucky, partly because I'm from Duke. And, <laughs> <laughs> I heard that. and I'm from Kentucky. Yeah. <laughs> the last lecture I gave at the University of Kentucky, I didn't think about it and I wore my Blue Devil. <laughs> oh, exactly. But um, I, yeah, this warms my heart a lot because uh, I was involved in uh, something called the NIDA Drug Abuse Treatment Network, which did a lot of the initial studies on MAT. And at the time, we didn't know what was going to come out of it, but it's clearly working. And we heard this morning from three 
people in the facility, um, all the themes that you're bringing up, and I'm not allowed to comment on specifics of legislation in my current job, but I'm very intrigued by your um, thoughts about um, earning your way to have a clean record. Because what we heard clearly from the people today was they were having trouble getting a job, and one of them told a, you know just a very specific story about landing a job and then losing it before you actually started because of uh, the stigma associated with methadone. Check the box. Check the box. Yeah. So um, I, I think this is going to be a really important part of the story. But also, as I told them, I have hypertension, so I take my pills almost every day. I'm not perfect. But nobody says after two years you should stop your pills. They say if your blood pressure is still high, you take the medicine for life. And what I, we also heard today was people are feeling like after a certain period of time they lose whatever the support is they have to stay in treatment and I think that's got to be dealt with uh, mm -hmm. also. It's Great. a chronic lifelong issue that yes. needs to be dealt with. Can I say just one thing because I, I'm pretty familiar with what Matt does and how successful they've been and what everybody has done in, in, in treatment center and care and all of you. Um, Matt's in a, uh, uh, it's not accredited, correct? Mm -hmm. And so, so Recovery Point does not get Medicaid, Medicare reimbursement. Those are strictly funding, basically private nonprofits. Or through the state. We fund. State. We fund. You the, the, yeah. the governor. And we're trying to write. I'm trying on the federal level to write to where they can participate. If they have, if we have a plan that we can be, that's going to be met, so we can show the success ratio to where basically non-accredited would have it. It would be what do we call it. What 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 do you call it? The name. I forget the name. I uh, basically, it's 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 uh, you have the prestigious of the world and, and the, from from a structured for a non-structured, and we're saying the non-structured works in many ways as well as a structure can work too. We need them all, so we're trying to figure out how to get them into the mix. If we can do that, and basically we're going to need your help on the federal level because or my my friend here knows from the political end of it. That's tough for a politician to say, okay. I'm not going to put you in jail, even though maybe people think I should, because I think if you'll go to this and you're on daily reporting and you're working and you're providing, and it keeps a person out of jail, a jail bill, bill for somebody, but you get a person, then if they know they can work themselves out and get their record looked at to get one time relief of an expungement, that carrot, how many of them stay with it or how many do you all have drop out, that drop out of the system because they just lose hope because they figure, when I get to the end, I don't have a job anyway. So they say, okay, what's your success ratio? Ours, depending on the program, but, but our women and children's program, because we're looking mm -hmm. at the data now, is uh, over 90%. Yeah. And they get jobs. Uh, while they're in our program, we provide daycare for their kids. Right. And so we help them get jobs, because we also have supported employment and supported mm -hmm. housing. Our folks can't find a place to live Yes, a lot of times. And so we've learned through treatment that it, treatment isn't enough. And, and we have prevention, we have, we go all the way through recovery homes, we have them too. But we found out this isn't just about treatment. If, if people don't have basic needs met, it's not going to matter. What about their criminal records? Uh, criminal records kill us because we're a licensed behavioral health provider, which means we're bound by all of those rules around hiring peer support. We, have, we hire a lot of peer support, peer and recovery coaches, and we can't we can't find a, a workforce. And it's for all of our jobs. Um, it's very challenging when you have these these requirements that say if you have this kind of criminal activity because we're licensed as well, we can't hire you. That makes me feel like a hypocrite because, you know, we're helping people, but I can't hire the very people I help. Matt, how many think, people, well, to both of you, how many people have a, a record, have, have a criminal record that are in your treatment? <clears throat> So we've got 100 50, beds in Huntington. We have 60% that are felonious offenders. We've got 60 beds in Bluefield, West Virginia. All 60 are high-risk, high-need felonious offenders through the Justice Reinvestment Act. And Ours then, is probably 50. Yeah, so it, it's well over 50% of each Let me just say, one, one of the other parts of the uh, Justice Reinvestment, I call it a finishing school, but for those yeah. people who are coming up, who, who are become eligible for parole, most of them go to the Salem what was used to be the Salem Youth, youth Home. But basically, I've got counselors in that place, you know, uh, right now, 
from Workforce West Virginia that's sitting there with them, see what skills they got and so forth. In order, if they're out there looking for jobs, we've also got a program where we will bond, if you'll hire mm -hmm. one of our it's complex, mm -hmm. that we will bond if it causes your business some mm -hmm. loss or something like that, this bond will pay back mm -hmm. just to encourage people to hire uh, f uh, former convicts. So, I mean, I, I, there's no doubt that there's still the stigma out there, mm -hmm. but at the same time, you know, if these people, we find something they can do and try to match them up, and we got job counselors in there trying to do that mm -hmm. before they're finally uh, granted their parole and trying to get them in jobs. There are certain things that we know they'll never do, but there's also certain jobs out there that they can do where they're not working exactly. at the bank. Yeah, you know, we got a lot of outside heavy work that, that, that can be done. But anyhow, that's what we're tr attempting to do before that parole is granted, is make sure that they got a place to live and a place to, to work and support themselves, along with that community-based treatment. And I think just to sort of uh, add to that conversation, the governor's he's pulled together everyone associated with workforce into a group to try to make sure that we're focusing our attention on that population. And so, yes, there may be things they can't do, but this has been on the table on the governor's advisory council on substance abuse from day one, this issue of how do we deal with the offender population. And although we've made great strides, it's a state-by-state state issue, and I do think it's something that take back to the, to the, the as a federal issue, is how do we address that on a more national basis, not just on a state-by-state state basis. And it's on the agenda of the Chamber of Commerce as well, because we're talking about jobs in many different, in the private sector, not just in treatment. I mean, it's challenging everywhere. I'd like to move on a little bit to talk about what we've done with prescribers. I think maybe Dr. Hall could speak to the, to the education and training that we've done for prescribers. I'm sure you're interested in that yes. as being the commissioner for the FDA. Can we talk about, we've made great strides in West Virginia. Thank you. Uh, and I'm honored to be here. I look around the table when it's all about collaboration and integration. And I think I've worked with almost everybody at the table in some format along that line. And if you'll give me your home address, I'll mail you a thundering herd and a mountaineer time. <laughs> <laughs> we're them in the future. <laughs> uh, it's a lovely tie story. Um, we're, we're trying to change the culture of society. And, and what we've realized here in West Virginia is we have to change the culture of medicine. And not just physicians, but all the disciplines. Uh, and it all started with the three, three hour mandated legislation, which had a lot of. 13 bullet points to be touched on and since 2011 we've been doing an addiction conference which started out at about 100 and has grown last year to 280 and this year we're expecting well over 300. We have very relevant topics, national speakers on the forefront of medicine but also a lot of West Virginia speakers with state specifics related to what's going on with prescribing and overdose tests etc. As part of that, we also do uh, support of some other educational events like the Addiction Treatment Institute that Dr. Sullivan does. And the Addiction Conference has actually grown to include uh, 11 different disciplines that come to that, including social workers, attorneys, dentists, pharmacists, nurses, and doctors. So we have them all in the same room here in the same education, talking the same talk, in an effort to change that culture. And it's just continued to grow. We, in 2015, did a statewide mailer that had a clinician's pocket guide with a lot of screening intervention basics that any physician would, would need to know or should know and have it accessible in their pocket. Uh, we also did a, a naloxone flyer. In 2016, we're doing the same addiction conference. Uh, it is a collaborative with WBU, uh, the State Medical Association, the Osteopathic Association. Uh, the licensure boards are very supportive, the DHHR and the Bureau. And it is truly a collaborative educational event with evidence-based medicine. Uh, West Virginia University has been extremely supportive, uh, Dr. Marsh in particular. Uh, we actually helped develop a three-hour web course uh, that's required uh, for doctors to be able to get more easily and affordable uh, at their convenience uh, with, again, the state-of-the-art education. Uh, this year, to date, we've educated about 1,500 physicians in the last six months with that web course. It just came live in March with the updated version. So we're doing the right thing. We're trying to change the culture. Uh, and we're doing, uh, targeting all the disciplines that we need to target, not just the physicians. And we just need to keep doing it. And that cultural change will just continue to get better. Now we do have mandatory prescriber education. I don't know if Dr. Fahim or Dr. Gupta, you or Dr. Marsh, any of you want to talk about what's required. I mean, we this is something that's been 
you know, uh, legislation has been in place for years, but we try to ensure that they are educated, and we think that's really important. Yeah, that's what spent, spun off the legislation and what we've been able to do with the addiction conference is add to it clinical relevance. So it's only three hours is required, but our addiction conference actually is about 14 hours, so we're able to add a lot of other stuff to it relative to comorbidities, and, uh, what recovery really is, uh, the disease model of addiction and things that are much more beneficial. And we're also doing this year two uh, MAT trainings. Charles, one in Charleston, one in Morgantown, and again with working with WVU, Dr. Marsh and Dr. Sutter. So I'm really we just glad, keep adapting. I'm really glad to hear that because um, I think that I've done a lot of medical education in my career, and you know, in general, if it's a required program and it's not very exciting, people will watch a football mm -hmm. game or something while they're, um, <coughs> you know, clicking the boxes on the internet um, for their things that you have to. Do but what docs really love is real life, and you, you mentioned it's not just docs, which is true. I mean, we, we need to make sure dentists are in there too. From what we're seeing, in addition to the spectrum that you described, what they love are, is education that speaks to the clinical experiences that they're having, so that they're equipped to deal with situations that aren't just check the box like don't prescribe more opioids. It's critical that we get that message across, but. Then they say, okay, what should we do? And um, I think going deeper there is really, as we're talking with people, how to put together comprehensive education about pain mm -hmm. and then get the reimbursement system to match it because when you tell a doc, don't write a prescription for an opioid, and they say, like, the person's come back three times with pain and I can't, there's no funding for a comprehensive pain management program. I, I don't know. Dr. Marshall, what, what you're doing at West Virginia or at Marshall with? Sure. Yes. Well, great to have you here, and, uh, and I could acknowledge everybody around the table as far as leadership. There's just been an amazing team effort that's gone into trying to come up with some solutions to this really vexing problem. So, you know, as we go forward, our hope <coughs> is that we can not only, and, and I think you said it really nicely, Dr. Caleb, we can not only come up with educational frames and classes and all this. We can come up with real life experiences for people, both simulation based, which I think is really a powerful way to teach, and, and also starting to look at training people who are gonna be in the field, yeah. who are going to encounter people who have overdosed. So one of the, the, the areas that we are extending to, in addition to our medical providers and our dental providers and and our mid-level providers and, and pharmacists, et cetera, is our first responder from the police force and, and you know, using <coughs> the ability to train people in the Loxone administration. And that has been life-saving. Oh, and yeah. obviously that's the first step toward getting people into the, you know, the chronic opioid addiction program, which Dr. Sullivan leaves, or medication-associated treatment. But ultimately, we want to make sure we have a live person to, to move to the next step. And I think that's been very powerful. We also are, are starting to try to understand better how we can provide, as you just articulated, a, a set of options for people to pay. Because we <coughs> use one as a, as a provider, at least in the past. Um, it's, it's one of the most vexing and difficult problems that a clinician has to deal with. And I think that the, the goal would be one not to start people on opioids if you can help it because better to prevent the start than you know try to stop. But then to look at alternative therapies. And we're working with the Samueli Institute in Washington DC to come up with alternative strategies for pain control, you know, both spiritual, behavioral, um, looking at um, complementary alternative strategies like massage, biofeedback, acupuncture, et cetera. Because really what we want to do is we want to start to treat the root of the problem, not necessarily the, only the external expression of the problem. And obviously good medical diagnosis and you know if there's something more structural. Lastly, I would say that, that and, and I have written about this a little bit, but I was really influenced uh, by Sam Quinones, who came here and visited. He wrote the book Dreamland, and he's done a, really a lot of work. And he said he thought the most important thing that we had to solve for addiction was isolation and the breakdown of community. 
because ultimately he believes that isolation is something that favors drug abuse and addiction, and in fact, it creates isolation. So, so as we go forward, issues like trying to get people back to work, to give them a sense of purpose, to connect them to other people, a sense of community and pride and empowerment, I think are really critical issues for us to deal with as we hope to make at least a dent in this really, really difficult problem. Do you think? Can I say one thing on prescribing? Because we have 20, <laughs> 2758, and it's basically, it's the uh, Promoting the Responsible Opioid Prescribing Act. This bill here would decouple, it'll decouple hospital physician payments from questions on the uh, patient satisfaction survey. We find that to be a big, it's a big, big deal, and it's an easy fix for the big deal because when this came about, I went, I had gone up to uh, uh, Lewis Johnson VA Center, and the woman says, she says, well, I'll tell you one thing, if you wouldn't keep deducting and keep writing me and all of you politicians mm -hmm. jumping on me every time these addicted soldiers call you, uh, he was basically saying, we've got soldiers that come back addicted, we're trying to help them. But they get, you know, an act, it gets mean if they don't get what they want. They write a bad survey, and, and I didn't know if it was coupled yes. also to the payments reimbursement. So we're trying to, oh, yeah. so Carl, we're trying to decouple all of that there, and I think that would help immensely. It allows you all to do your job a lot better as professionals, and these are the type of things we're going to probably need you all's. We're going to, I know you don't usually get involved, but if we would ask you to come and give us your opinion on basically how these things would work in some of our committees that we have. Well, we are, uh, I mean, there is a lot of communication going on, with, like I say, with Francis Collins at NIH and Andy Slavitt at CMS. We're it's a mutual Well, uh, CDC, problem. I was happy to see CDC with their, with their uh, uh, new uh, guidelines. guidelines on prescription. Mm -hmm. uh, and then you all joined on with them in, in promoting that. And that was, a, that was a break from the past. As you know, we were very upset about the past. And that was a break from the past. And I credit you with that break from the past because I'm not sure it would have happened a year or two years ago. Now, I would like to point out, maybe Dr. Becker can speak to, and I think you'd be interested to know, you probably are not aware, Senator, but the West Virginia has really taken a step forward with the CDC guidelines, and we're actually going to implement those CDC guidelines with our Medicaid program in partnership with our MCOs. So I don't know if Beck, Dr. Becker could speak to it, but I think it's a best practice, the, the concept. If you really believe in that, we need to figure out how to embrace it. Well, welcome, Dr. Kelly. Um, I've been um, actually a primary care provider here in the state for 27 years, and um, I, I experienced all of these transitions that all of the drug use issues have gone through. But I, I think many of us recognize that we had to get a handle on the prescription drug as an entry point. And um, I th finally, that this, with the CDC's support, we now have some really nice, clear guidelines, I think, that we can use as a basis for setting new requirements on uh, providers and systems and how they actually manage people with chronic pain. So our system, DHHR, our, all of our partners, our public employ employees insurance agency, and others have come to the table and said, we're going to actually carve out practical ways that we can implement the recommendations of the CDC. And so on things like providing non-pharmacological therapies, we're exploring the idea of new codes to cover that might give you the option for some other approach to managing pain that gets you around the need to prescribe opiates. We um, are obviously encouraging everybody to monitor those folks carefully, communicate risk better, um, utilize drug screening in the process, set some, some limits. And we already, uh, Vicki, who's here with me from pharmacy, Vicki and I have been working for quite a while on trying to get the morphine equivalent dose as a way of reporting on the use and tracking the use. And we've done that also in cooperation with our contractors up at WVU. We, we're doing that with the, with the folks at the Board of Pharmacy. And I think we're really heading in the right direction. This thing has come a long way with a lot of input, and I think we're pretty much close to a final product on it. Our goal would be to implement that before the end of the year. I think we think that, and we'll be able to give you outcome information yeah. after we do it. Fantastic. I mean, I would stress as part of this, uh, measuring outcomes is going to be critical because um, the guidelines are, are, um, are great and they provide the guideposts, but we still have a lot to learn. And you know, when they looked at the evidence for the guidelines, there was a lot of need for more knowledge um, to, to do things even better. So as you implement them, measuring what happens, I think could, could really 
be a national contribution, not just a local contribution. Can I ask you a question? So, so my understanding is, if you look at West Virginia, West Virginia is the only state in the country that is purely Appalachia. And when you look at the death rate in Appalachia on an equivalent basis to urban areas, ours is going up, but almost everybody else's is going down. And when you look at the drug problem that we have in the state, you know, and you look at Angus Deaton's article in PNAS that looks at, at an increased amount of, of white middle-aged people that are dying at a rate that is sort of AIDS epidemic-like rate and dying of suicide, drug overdose, and, and liver disease. What do you think it is different about our state and the Appalachian region that is, you know, that, and whether this is tied up into the problems that we're having, you know, with the drug problems? You're asking me to step way outside of my FDA hat, but as an academic uh, for 32 years, I can't resist a comment. And I have to say, um, as, as I think I mentioned, but, but right before I came to FDA, we had this big project that had several counties in North Carolina. Equipment County, Mississippi, and Mingo County, West Virginia. And the goal was to use electronic health records comprehensively to look at the whole population's health and try to improve it. And it was, you know, you mentioned the, the, um, the race demographic, and it was interesting that the death rates in Equipment County, West Virginia, I mean, Equipment County, Mississippi, and Mingo County, West Virginia were almost identical. <coughs> Equipment County is about 80% African American. Uh, Mingo County is almost all white. So race is not the issue. But the patterns of death also look to be somewhat different. Equipment County being driven largely by hypertension stroke. Still with a lot of illicit um, drug use for, um, and, and Mingo County, um, you know, a very high rate of this addiction related stuff. Um, that you've mentioned, and I, I think, so this is way outside my FDA, but I think the social fabric is really clearly an issue, and, and, and I'll bring it up among you all, I didn't want to bring it up at the MAT Center, but um, religion and faith didn't come up at all in our discussion, and I think if you went back a generation here, you would probably see the church was a pretty big part of people's lives, but uh, at the MAT Center, um, it was more gravitating to the group therapy and the support coming through the center as opposed to uh, the church. And I think that's a difference in culture that's happening. Now, it's not our job at FDA to fix that, but we, we need to think of ways, the things that we can do that will support people doing better. I will say, I mean, Tim may be able to discuss it. We've put, a, I mean, the Governor's Advisory Council on Substance Abuse put a lot of time and energy in the education of young people. We believe that's going to be a big focus. And so, Tim might talk a little bit to the group about some of, I think, some good work we've done on making sure if you're dealing with the culture of it, you can't just deal on the back end. We have to deal on the front end. Well, again, welcome to West Virginia. Um, as Governor Tomlin mentioned, uh, through his leadership dividing the state of West Virginia into uh, six different regions, I coordinate Region 5, which is 10 counties, but also work very closely with the other coordinators in the other five regions as well. SAMHSA did a nationwide survey, and over 70% of the kids in the survey said they can get tobacco, alcohol, and prescription drugs at home. Um, so we, we understand from a prevention standpoint, we've got to educate parents and grandparents about the availability of these drugs in their homes. Uh, we also know that West Virginia, we lead the nation in the number of prescriptions per capita as well. So. One of the things that we've done um, with uh, Region 5 underneath the leadership of Karen Jost and Prestera, we're the fiscal agent. We've invested very heavily in developing and funding local coalitions uh, in an amount of about $200,000 a year at the local level, uh, Mingo County being one of them. And I'm very pleased to say that last year, Mingo County, through the coalition and partnership with the Board of Education, implemented an evidence-based program from kindergarten all the way up to 12th grade uh, throughout the year. So that's something very, very important. The other thing that we're seeing in uh, our state is a very strong uh, emphasis on youth empowerment and youth leadership. Uh, we know that these kids are in those schools every day. They're on the school bus. They're at the school uh, bus stop. They're at the after school programs. I may get the opportunity to go in <coughs> once or twice a semester and speak to the kids, but they're every day. So our expanding and funding and encouraging uh, what we refer to as our SAD chapters, which is Students Against Destructive Decisions, 
to give them that voice on a regular basis. As a matter of fact, in Wayne County, the SAD chapter at Buffalo Middle School twice a week goes over and implements the evidence-based program at the Buffalo mm -hmm. Elementary School. Now, I go in, I'm just another adult. Those kids go in, they're rock stars. So those <laughs> kids, they interact with them, they listen. So it does two things. It gives the elementary students the message, but it reinforces the same message in those middle school students. Another thing that we've been involved in is funding and implementing in every one of our counties a permanent prescription drop box. So that uh, we all know that twice a year the DEA has a drug take backs. We don't want people waiting six months in their homes. So through our sheriff's departments, state police, and our city police, we now have opportunities anytime those facilities are open, anyone can go in and dispose of any unwanted or expired medication. It's interesting, last year in Cabell County, we had a lady that came in that had prescription medication dated 1978. She'd kept that in her home. 1978. So if we know kids are getting it at home, and if we can get it out of the homes, the extras, then we're doing very well. One of the things we've also been very excited about is we have four of our counties that have partnered with the Appalachian High Intensity Drug tra Trafficking Area to implement what we refer to Give Me a Reason. We provide free home drug testing kits to parents, the middle school and high school level. Um, also very excited that we have four of our county schools that have implemented countywide middle school and high school uh, random drug testing for any student that drives a car or participates in extracurricular activity. We want to identify the problem as early as we can and get them the help that we can. Uh, so those things are very, very important to us, uh, educating in our schools, educating in our homes. Uh, you mentioned uh, the, the importance of faith-based. We have a church in Cabell County that implemented an evidence-based evidence -based program called Keep a Clear Mind on Wednesday night in their youth group. So we see it from our prevention, we've got to have the entire community involved in that message and being able to do that. And, and we're seeing less students now using tobacco in West Virginia. We're seeing the numbers with youth uh, using uh, marijuana going down. We're certainly seeing them with the prescription uh, pills going down. So those messages have to be important we don't want to wait till they're at the high school and they've already experimented or it's already there. We need to get those messages of prevention at the, as early as we can. Governor, would you comment on what uh, Kathy D'Antoni's doing? It just it made me think about with, I think this is an important piece of the school connection. Yes, Dr. D'Antoni, excuse Dr. me. Dr. D'Antoni, uh, as Karen mentioned earlier, I have the, the West Virginia Workforce Council, which has got everybody that's dealing with education around the table from you know, pre-K through uh, higher education and, and you know, all of us trying to figure out how to get more people back into the workforce. But one of the programs we're doing is, is a simulated workplace. And we, those of us who grew up back in the 70s, <laughs> where you found up on the <laughs> is, is, you know, we, we had the vocational schools yes. throughout the country. But we've moved more to, to a, a more hands-on approach for the students. In our, and we're taking it statewide with Workforce West Virginia. But part of the, the deal is you come through that, and when you graduate high school, you're ready to go on into higher education or, or into a job. But beyond that, uh, there's two or three things. You get a certification that you completed this thing, you've showed up on time, you've done all the things that employers are looking for. There are, every one of these students are drug tested on a regular basis. And they come out with a certificate that, in, in addition to the certificate they've got from going through the uh, uh, work, uh, work, what's that? Simulation. Simulation. Work, uh, workforce. You've also got your uh, uh, drug-free card that you can hand to an employer. And I think, you know, as, as I talk to employers, that's one of the, always the biggest complaints they have around the state is finding somebody that's drug-free that's going to show up to work or that can pass a drug test. You know, there'll be jobs announced and uh, 50 people will apply and uh, 30 of them can't pass a drug test. So, you know, I mean, it's, it's a problem we know, but I think as far as getting our young people and getting them through the, the, their senior year in high school and getting them ready for that next step of their life and to have a cert certification that you complete that program plus a certification that you're drug free is pretty positive. And there's a, a lot more students entering that track than mm -hmm. what used to be because mm -hmm. it used to be kind of a stigma attached if you went to vocational. Today, there's some of those jobs are better paying than our four years degree. So, you know, yeah. I, th I think, you know, it's just another thing we're doing to keep our workforce or getting more people in their workforce and having them clean when they go in.
Absolutely. Well, it seems like this combination of the positive <clears throat> thing, uh, but I do want to mention we think this um, disposal thing is just absolutely critical because, you know, mm -hmm. uh, pardon me with this, but I got two sons, and, you know, until they were about 25, there was no way they were even going to understand what risk was. So you leave pills hanging around, and it's trouble. So, you know, we're very much in favor of disposal programs and really reinforcing everybody to get rid of any extra pills. Of course, starting with prescribing fewer to begin with. Mm -hmm. Yeah, well, one of the other steps, and Karen will probably get into it, but I, I think it's going to prove in one of the leaders around the country is, is uh, the use of naloxone or Narcan. Um, and it's one there's a lot of controversy, a lot of states who didn't want to do it. But as we have, <coughs> especially DHHR has, and our, our uh, licensing agents have, have cracked down on pill mills and so forth, <coughs> you know, we've tried a lot of that up. Doctors are prescribing, in my opinion, a lot more responsibly than they were five or six years ago. Some doctors are. <coughs> but I should clarify that. But, yeah, the thing of it is we have once again shifted from, from what our original problems was with the high prescription drug overdoses that we had to the more that back to the street drug and the, and the yes. more powerful heroin. And obviously, you know, to be able to, uh, we were able to get it changed where at least first responders uh, were able to, to carry and administer the uh, 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 naloxone. A couple of years ago, this past year, is where anybody could get a family member, and, and with some training from the pharmacy uh, uh, board or pharmacists across the state to to teach you how to use it. And I, I, Karen's probably got a better idea, or Dr. Gupta, of uh, how many doses that has been used in this state, just to give you an idea of how many probably deaths we would have had without that. And, you know, my thoughts, you know, the, the, the naysayers are saying, oh, it just, you know, gives them uh, more encouragement they can go back and do it again. The way I look at it is every life we save gives that individual the opportunity mm -hmm. to go get help there and live a productive life. Absolutely. Dr. Gupta, you may want to speak to that a little bit because I think we've done some pretty extensive work on that. Sure. Dr. Marsh as well. You know, absolutely. And, and one of the, absolutely, Governor, you're right, that uh, the naloxone that actually just became last month over the counter in the sense that people can now go and uh, with the, we have a protocol in place that the pharmacy or pharmacy intern can even at the request provide some mandatory training uh, uh, information to the patient and then give it the pill and then register it. That way uh, we're trying to make that more available. Uh, what we saw even from making it available more to the family caregiver from previous years uh, legislation was that our uptake just by the EMS agencies went up by 50% last year. So we had a more than half increase just last year because of that, and that has been so, um, as not as controversial as other places. Another program that has been very successful, uh, less controversial, uh, again, in West Virginia, uh, is harm reduction programs. One of the things, great things that's happening <coughs> across communities in West Virginia is we talk about um, risk and, and making sure that we could reduce the risk is the needle exchange programs. Mm -hmm. and, and how we are linking those needle exchange programs is really a comprehensive. So what, right now we're in the midst of developing evaluation to make sure that we have bases and measures behind what we're doing in terms of, as the governor mentioned, we're in the midst of moving from just the pills to something that people with pills are 40 times more likely to do, which is heroin. And now that heroin is coming with fentanyl, uh, mm -hmm. you know, as we continue to see, um, these fentanyl doses, which is about a hundred times more potent than mm -hmm. heroin, we're seeing that people are having a risk of overdose. So, biggest problem is to get people clean needles so that when they are using, uh, we, and then at some point, what we're seeing from some of the evidence is it takes a few visits before people mm -hmm. feel like, okay, I need to get help. So we want to be there to help them with getting into counsel, rehab, treatment, those things and ultimately back in the workforce. But that's happening, and that's been quite successful in the areas. We're working now to develop evidence and data behind it and measures and standardize that practice, along with uh, monitoring the risk, what happens with needles, which is hepatitis and HIV. So that's the biggest one of the biggest concerns. And we certainly have enhanced surveillance towards those diseases. I think, you know, we're finding that um, people are really underestimating this risk of HIV and, and uh, hepatitis, CDC is all over it, but it's hard to get the message out to people who aren't reading the newspapers or watching 
the news on TV, so I'm glad you all are doing that. I also want to just make sure you knew we're going to have a public hearing about naloxone in, uh, it's early October, right? And, um, you know, we'd welcome you all to come and uh, tell people what you've learned. The purpose of the hearing, you know, having spent a lot of time developing new therapies, um, this is a hard one to study, right, because you can't do like a regular clinical <coughs> trial of naloxone like you would a normal drug development program. So now we want to refine the dosage and how you use it in different circumstances. And we're also looking hard at this over-the-counter issue to try to make it uh, more available. And certainly the HHS and presidential uh, standard is, is very pro-naloxone, despite the concerns that have been raised. Um, you know, you can't get a new start if you're not alive. So right. I think uh, issue number one is being alive, and then we can take it from there. Right, keep them alive. I, I think that, as far as I know, almost all, and Dr. Gupta can speak to it, but I think almost all our first responders, our ambulance drivers, our uh, EMTs, that now are, have most of our police, uh, at least in the larger cities, mm -hmm. are all carrying it. And, and because a lot of times the police will get there before the EMTs, and obviously, and we recognize some of our police officers, our state police and so forth, that have been there and actually saved lives before the EMTs were able to get there. And, and, and I don't know whether uh, our, uh, Dr. Gupta's office has a number, but how many lives have actually been saved? Uh, oh. I mean, it's been quite a few. Yeah, Governor, it's, yeah, absolutely. I think we have a certain number of, uh, you know, obviously the amount of doses in tens of thousands mm -hmm. that have been used. Uh, obviously. Tens of thousands. Yeah. yeah. So obviously when we use those doses, yeah. we know that certain percentage is harder to, as you know, from a research perspective, difficult to put a number of that. But certainly we know that a lot of those are those that we are actually saving and getting them back into treatment and rehab. So that's very clear. And we got the intranasal and uh, auto injector now um, also available. So I think you know better to prevent it. But if you got it, there's just no sense in having people die unnecessarily. John, can I ask you a question? We're, we're talking about how we treat the addicted. Uh, how do we stop the pharmaceuticals from putting all this product on the market? Yes, sir. How in the world do you turn them down? How many of them that come to you that want a new drug on the market? Do we not have enough? What's that? I'm just saying. No, I mean, there, there are issues going on with it now. <laughs> well, there's issues, but the bottom I mean, line is, is that do we turn anybody down? Do they, do they just know if they go through this process and they spend so many years developing something, uh, and they're going to come to you, and if it meets everything they say it does, and you know, I guess we're asking, what authorities do you have to say we don't need any more product? We got enough product on the market. Don't bring it to me because we're not going to prove it. Well, let me, um, I'll say a few words about this, and um, it, it's, a, as you know, it's pretty complicated in a well, long discussion. We've but been having good talks with DEA also, <laughs> Yeah. so we're in. So, um, basically, um, the consideration um, traditionally at FDA is the risk-benefit for the person for whom the treatment is prescribed. And um, with permission, I'll just, um, my mother turns out to be a great example of almost everything at the FDA. She's eight years old. She's got, got multiple myeloma. She's eight years into it. Her life has been saved by four different new multiple myeloma treatments that have come on the market just when she relapses. And it's been an amazing extension of life. But she's got a recurrence now. And she's, by the way, on another new treatment. But she's having terrific bone pain. So she's on opioids for the first mm -hmm. time. And it's made a huge positive difference. So. Um, we, we need opioids for certain circumstances, but you raise the question, do we need more on the market? Just a couple of quick things to say. First of all, we know that uh, over 60% of the current sales are just plain old-fashioned Percocet and the other common one, his name I always forget. But Narva? Vicodin. Vicodin, yeah. Vicodin. Yeah. And um, the new ones that have come on the market haven't had much penetration. It's a tiny fraction. And there's a paper coming out on this that shows all the data. But having said that, we're not seeing new applications other than abuse deterrent formulations for new opioids. And we very much want to get abuse deterrent formulations out there to replace the ones that are currently there. Recognizing that we don't know enough yet about abuse deterrent formulations, but just common sense that if it's hard to crush it up and inject it 
it's going to make it that much harder to use it. So we do have applications coming through on abuse deterrence, but the other problem that I've discussed with you that we have is we can't stop generics from coming on the market. Mm -hmm. There's no way for us to do that because the law says if you make a generic that's the same as the originator, you just have to prove Can that. the DEA, because we're, I'm confused, we have the DEA, so you know all of us, all the states have been hit, Illinois, Dirk, Dick Durbin, all of us. We had DEA come in because basically they're the ones that, that, that uh, authorize how much product's going to be on the market. It's been increasing, increasing, increasing. We keep asking. We can't figure out, you know, how, how interconnected you two are, FDA, DEA. Establishing what market, what what's needed in the marketplace. How do we get to this volume that we have now, which we consume 80 or 90 percent of the opiates in the world? Who made that, that determination? Well, so let, let's break it down into two parts. I would say, um, you know, it's a it's a it's a maybe a three-part issue. First of all, um, there's no doubt um, American pharmaceutical industry is a driver and when there's it's a business um, model. It, there's a business model there. Doctors have been prescribing it if we as we've discussed. Um, Lack of we, t looking back we can say it was irresponsible. Uh, yeah. At the time uh, I, I think it's been brought up there was yeah. tremendous pressure on doctors to stop out all pain mm -hmm. and not adequate um, awareness of this. And then you got the issue of general supply and I think we got a meeting coming up in about a month with you and a bunch of other senators mm -hmm. to talk about this. Um, I can no longer say I'm new on the job. I'm five and a half months into the job. But a real lesson for me has been federal agencies working together. Um, it's not as smooth as it should be, but uh, by the time we show up in September, we'll... Do you know the DA, the new director there? Not personally. <clears throat> but get, I think we're going to work on putting you all together. Hopefully I, you all get I together. I think you've already had that impact. So. <laughs> um, I, just basically the way it works is we do a calculation every year. Of, um, it's a model-based thing because you can't get the exact numbers, but it's essentially how many opioids have been prescribed the year before and then project. Um, and we give that to DEA, and the DEA uses that model to make a decision on what the ceiling is on the amount that can be manufactured. And um, you all have raised the question. How they say they're, they're answered. I mean, you wouldn't believe the discussions we're having, but we're getting yeah. into the, the, the battle yeah. of the beast right now, let me tell you, the first time. And so we need to directly, this yeah. is not going to be solved at a lower level. We need to get together and, and solve it. I would just uh, suggest you have somebody to look at some of the news accounts in West Virginia over the last six months mm -hmm. on the amount of opioids that has been prescribed in the state of West Virginia over the last five years. Mm -hmm. I think you would be amazed. Stay with 1.8 million people. It's really, I mean, it, it prompted, and I maybe have Kathy speak to it, but it did prompt the uh, the governor to work with the legislature to put in. Uh, actually, um, we call it peel mill, but I mean the it, peel uh, regulation, pain regulation, to ensure that. Doctors are just not writing them haphazardly. I don't know how to speak to it specifically, but maybe details. The only thing I'll, I'll, I'll say about it is, for many years, and I've been around here for many years, but I used to speak to the the uh, state medical chairman of the state medical association, or what your association, and say, you guys need to police yourself a little bit better. I mean. There are things going on in our communities, and people knows what's going on in their communities. But people were, were reluctant, doctors were reluctant to ever stand up and talk about the, the real issue out there. And finally, it's come to a head, and uh, I think our our licensing board, our regulatory boards, the state of West Virginia, the last couple of years, Dr. Fahim and others are, are doing a much better job than what they did several years ago. So, I mean, that has helped tremendously, I think, and some of the, the, the pill mills were out there. But, and to have a five minute visit with a doctor and out the back door is, I don't think, the way the medical profession should be practicing. I'm not here to lecture, I'm no. just saying. But, but I, I think to the governor's point that, you know, we, uh, you know, our, our state medical board, uh, Dr. Fain could speak to it and Kathy could speak to our state regulations. We made a, a, I think, a strategic decision that we're gonna have to regulate it ourselves. And we've been able to actually close Several. I don't know the number, Kathy. You might. I can't tell you the number off the top of my head, but a couple of years ago, 
the state began um, licensing and regulating chronic pain management clinics. Um, and you know, <coughs> it was a good exercise and experience for us. And it allowed us also to develop good working relationships with both the Board of Medicine and the Board of Osteopathic Medicine. Um, and we've worked well together to um, make certain that um, you know, the clinics out there, um, certainly subject to our regulation, um, are engaging in responsible prescribing practices. That's the key, I think. Dr. Fame, you want to speak to it just a little yeah, thank bit? Thank you very much. I think, you know, like the, the discussion here has been obviously very helpful and focused on the consumers, which obviously is very important, but obviously we cannot forget the providers and the people who write the prescriptions. And obviously it's not true that they are all crooks and they're all in there to make money. And I think one of the things that has happened in West Virginia, which I'm very happy about, I chair the West Virginia Board of Medicine. And I happen to be also a board certified addiction psychiatrist, so uh, I could see the problem from both sides. And the board, uh, with the help of the governor's legislation and what has happened in the state, has been able to take a very balanced uh, view. Whereas we have been very successful in identifying and shutting down some uh, of the pill, pill mills or you know, doctors who have been just very careless in their prescribing, but also we have to be very careful uh, while we are looking out for the welfare of the consumer is that if you drive all the doctors away and uh, if they are so afraid that they are not going to prescribe and that they are not aware of the usefulness of these products, then we have uh, failed in our purpose. And I, I'm sure Governor and others, uh, and Senator Manchin, who have been real, you know, sort of advocates in that. Uh, and I think we have been able to do that in the state. We have paid a lot of emphasis on education. We have provided the doctors the tools that they need uh, with regards to how to monitor the patient, with regards to uh, the pharmacy board printout, trying to coordinate it and opening it up to the surrounding states and expanding it as much as possible. Also becoming very aware as to where this supply is coming from. Uh, states like Florida and you know some other places. Board has been very proud of the fact that we have been able to identify with the help of some adjacent state, some of our doctors who were having joint licenses through the Federation uh, to identify these doctors. And you know, sort of some of those had just jumped off the fence, went to Virginia, went to, you know, sort of surrounding states and were uh, uh, prescribing in their parking lots, uh, going into a motel and, uh, you know, just hiring a room. We have been able to identify that. So while, uh, at the same time, you know, we have been able to also uh, identify those doctors who are doing a good job, letting them know that uh, the purpose of the board is not all punitive. Uh, it is also educational. Uh, we want to make sure that uh, you can do th your job without, you know, having to uh, you know, sort of be disciplined. And uh, we have also, uh, one of the things that has happened is recently is that we have expanded our scope of investigation. Uh, we have hired uh, uh, more investigators. We have a committee that is very active. And we look, you know, every case at the merit of it. So it's not that we are rushing to make judgments. And the doctors, you know, sort of are understanding that and are uh, feeling more, uh, you know, secure in their practice. One of the most uh, important legislation that Karen and others have been very instrumental is, is uh, regulating Suboxone, uh, and, you know, which is a very useful product. And I think you know, just uh, in the uh, you know, response, uh, we, we have uh, accumulated, or uh, Raleigh and others have gotten several of the experts in the area to tinker with the rules and everything. And I think the way it is coming out should be very uh, helpful. And then the very usefulness of the naltrexone and the Vivitrol program. That is catching up, uh, and it is very useful, and the relapse rate in that uh, is also very, very good. Uh, and I think, uh, you know, like Raleigh has been, and, and Dr. Hall has been very instrumental. We are lucky. Uh, one of the things that we are lucky in uh, Senator Manchin and Governor is that we have a lot of uh, good experts in the area who have taken a lead and have really, you know, sort of from your university medical school to everybody here, uh, and Dean 
uh, Dean and I have had a long meeting and we discussed about, and, and the three things that are working together, uh, this is very important for your benefit, is that the Board of Medicine, the West Virginia State Medical Un uh, Association, and the university are working as partners. <coughs> and we are communicating with each other. I mean, you know, like uh, I was uh, once upon a time the president of the Medical Association. Rahul is coming in as the next president. He serves as the secretary of the board. So it's not me against them. I mean, you know, ultimately it is the patient. You know, I used to say that when I was on the uh, Medical Association is we wouldn't be here without our patients. So if we, ultimately it is the welfare of the patient. And so that's all we do. So I think it's working very well because you have to attack the problem from every aspect. I'm really heartened by this. Um, I have to say, you know, my feeling about it, I feel like it's entirely possible to find this balance. Part of the balance though is when you have scoundrels, you just have to be merciless with the scoundrels. And they're not hard to pick out the really bad ones. Um, but I would urge you to think about ways, as you mentioned, to reward the people doing a good job. I think a lesson we learned in cardiology, you know, when we went through the thing with quality and bypass surgery where the surgeons had to get used to having all their rates of everything happening publicly reported, um, it wasn't just that the bad ones quit operating, it was that the good ones were able to sort of advertise, hey, you know, here are my rates, they're really good, you're in good hands if you come to me as a surgeon or to our uh, facility. So I think that's really imp an important part of it. Tara, you haven't been, I want to leave you out down there. Uh, she hasn't been able to comment, but I, you've heard this conversation. Tara comes, she um, might want to share some, some sure. thoughts with um, us. So I'm with Young People in Recovery. I'm a long-term um, recovery, in, in long-term recovery and um, I guess I'd just like to say that, I mean, it started really young for me. I was in a car accident when I was 16, and uh, my jaws were wired shut. They gave me a two liter uh, prescription of uh, liquid codeine. And so that's kind of what, what got me started. Um, so I just think that the most important thing that we're discussing here is the uh, prescribing practices and the methods, um, education of physicians, and the prevention, like Tim was talking about. I think that's really at the heart of everything, and if we can tackle that as a state, then we'll be in a lot better place. I, I, something I've been meaning to say that related to something you brought up, Senator, and that um, corporate responsibility. Mm -hmm. So, uh, I mean, as you all know, the FDA doesn't regulate the practice of medicine. That's something that I'm trained to say, and it's very important <laughs> because, um, uh, you know, we, we write the instructions and the rules based on the evidence from studies. Doctors have the right to prescribe, even if it's not in the label from the FDA, based on their best judgment. But there's no question doctors have been influenced by the pharmaceutical industry. A lot of money has been made and we're working on the thoughts about what corporate responsibility means mm -hmm. here, which essentially to me means if you're, if, if you're making uh, a good bit of money on something which, like in my mom's case, it's good that opiates are available. Mm -hmm. um, you know, we're really happy that she's relieved of the pain. People should benefit if they produce and make those products, but this is, this is a product that also has this massive downside that you all have mm -hmm. identified. I think companies that are involved in it need to give something back. And you suggested legislation, as I said, I can't comment on that. It's, in, it's intriguing. But, you know, um, what should uh, companies that are benefiting from this be accountable for in terms of dealing with the consequences when it's unfortunate that someone does become um, addicted? Mm -hmm. What happens on legislation when people are looking for reason to be against legislation? They want to find a reason, as I so call the experts, as far as the agencies who have expertise, hoping they'll say something in the negative or comment negatively saying, this is why we can't vote for it. So basically what we try to do is if you're trying to get something passed, you go to this agency, let them know up front what we're trying to do and trying to accomplish. And even if they stay silent on it, then they can't use it against us. And, and sometimes I understand. It's a very delicate dance up there. Oh, uh, we learned. We learned. Well, one, one other thing, the workings of government, which I didn't understand, we are allowed to give what's called technical assistance. So, if, yes. if the senator's office calls us and says, "What do you think about this?" Here it is. We're allowed to um, 
comment to them. We but, just are not allowed to try of, to influence legislation. There's a lot of agencies, stations. such as the heads that, like yourself, that have been more politically involved that don't want to ruffle feathers on either side, you follow me, and they haven't. So they use that to, to hide behind. When you have someone, Dr. Caleb, with his expertise will come out and say, yes, I think that would be very helpful. That means the world to us to be able to move something forward. We're on the, cru we're on the, cru we're on the crutch of uh, moving some really good stuff. But we're going to need your help. Governor. I know one, one of the things, uh, Senator, I think you know, the federal would be some help for, for is you know, one of our problems is, as you well know, any place you travel around our state, you can be in stu two states within mm -hmm. a half hour sure. of any place. In some areas, four states, which means that up until recently, and probably still going on, you'd have four doctors in four states you'd probably see in three hours mm -hmm. and get the prescription filled and you're in business, basically. But we are doing much better, I think, as far as communicating and being able to access records from across our state lines. And I think, you know, especially as far as opioids go, I think that is so important because almost every state faces that when you get two or three you know, state borders coming up to, uh, against each other. You know, it's so easy for people to abuse them. And, and the doctor prescribing may not even know that you're seeing somebody else. But I think as medical records get better and being able to share information, Dr. Marsh, it's, I, I think that would be a lot of help to all of us. And using technology like uh, biometrics for identification of people so you know you got the right person. And, and we didn't really touch on it, and I won't belabor it, but we have a lot of pharmacy control measures as well. So we have a lot of monitoring of what's going on. We also have programs where people that get prescribed narcotics get contacted and talk about do they have residuals and you know are there things that we can help them with et cetera. So so I think that there are multiple steps. But but I would just say and I so much appreciate Senator Manchin's leadership. But Governor Tom, I think you deserve a great uh, debt of congratulations because I think you've made a huge difference in this. Truly. Yes, I think. Uh, uh, Dr. Becker, I know he's a family doc because he's had his hand politely raised for about a half hour. <laughs> Dr. Becker, I'm so sorry. He would have. That's true. I'm I'm so I, I just sorry. had to persist on this. A while ago, you, you made a comment about clinical trials, and I, I think that's probably an important role for the FDA is to kind of encourage clinical trials. I'm here also as the medical director for the Medicaid program. It would be very helpful to us if we had more clinical trials around MAT, especially head-to-head -head kind of trials to help us. We're now looking at the implant for buprenorphine. We're looking at naltrexone shots, the depot naltrexone shots. We, I, in my opinion, we need a whole lot more clinical trial information to help guide us. As an example, we have very little information to guide us on pregnant patients who have drug addiction. If the FDA could do anything to encourage that, it would be my advice, let's do it if we can. Let's send us a, a, a specific note on that. That would help me a lot. This is, this is my passion. We have agreement now across HHS that opioid-related research has got, got a priority. Mm -hmm. and. Um, we're trying to look at the gaps in research, but a note from the field of someone who's actually dealing with it would have a big impact. Well, I think we could definitely, we'll we could, well, you'll, you'll get a letter from us. I'm sorry to, uh, I know the time is being very, is very limited and I know everyone hasn't had an opportunity to, uh, I haven't really gotten through the questions. You could have uh, been here a lot longer. Uh, but I, does anyone have any burning comments they would like to make before? Yes, ma'am. Well, just one. I'm Joanne Grossi, the Regional Director of the U.S. Department of Health and Human Services for Region 3, which includes West Virginia. And the one thing we didn't bring up at all, be very quick, is the payer side. And, and I do think that's something we should incorporate into this conversation. You saw what Aetna's done now about really looking at um, notifying doctors who are prescribing too many opioids. And I do think that's something, you know, we should make sure we're including in this conversation is the payer side. Could, could I just add that, um, and thank you for being here, but um, I'd just like to add that we do have a prescription drug monitoring program oh, which we've yes. been able to enhance through funds from the CDC um, as we've implemented their guidelines and many people around this table have helped us write uh, papers on pain management, guidance for family physicians, but we've expanded our PDMP to um, cover other states, states that we border, and also to give each patient a rating of their danger for prescription drug overdose, overdose and it um, even includes benzodiazepines, which can add to the respiratory depression problem. So we are, we're working to expand that and make it 
a much more useful tool for physicians. We are looking closely at the combination of opioids and benzos now. I think some of you have sent in reports on this that are, uh, are, are very helpful. And I'd just like to say as a payer that pharma has contributed to this problem, so maybe as they develop those tamper-resistant drugs, they could help us as payers by reducing those costs because they're really not affordable, especially for public programs. I think that's an excellent point she makes. It, it is affordability and that becomes an issue. Dr. Governor. I mentioned the uh, 844 Help for West Virginia. We have these brochures <coughs> in every library, school, college, hospital, doctor's office. It shows the services that we provide for uh, substance abuse and the corresponding dots around the state. Uh, most of those are our population centers, but there are other areas, as I said, that we hope to expand those services to. But, you know, it's one of those things that at least people have an idea now where they can call and what's close by to, to get help. And uh, I think he's got all kinds of good things. <laughs> 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 Yes. Well, we, we actually get calls from other states asking us about how we set this up. So I do think it's, it's, it's a model that we're trying to share our, what we've learned from it. So we appreciate that. I'm really sorry we didn't get to everybody, but time is limited. So I wanted to give, uh, you know, Dr. Califf an opportunity to uh, make any comments or any burning questions that, uh, because we are limited in time, I apologize. I did the best I could, Governor. Uh, you, you're pretty quiet. <laughs> Well, I, I appreciate the chance to uh, be here, and I, you know, I do identify with you all. I actually was born in a place called Anderson, South Carolina, which you mentioned West Virginia being the pure uh, Appalachia, but that's right down at that southern uh, border of um, Appalachia, and I'm, I feel like I'm part of the culture here. My remit now is, you know, 300 million people, but um, you're, you're uh, like home, you know. I think we we'll take a, a we'll summarize what we've heard here and take it back to all the different aspects of the um, government, and we'll stay in touch. My next stop is actually back in Mingo County, so um, it'll it'll be good to hear what's going on there. But it seems like you all are on a good path with a long way to go, and um, you know I think. But you know it's the struggles in life that make you stronger, so. Um, I, I'm glad that you're moving ahead like you are, and um, we can count on the senator here to keep us on our toes. <laughs> <laughs> and, and I, you know, I know now I'm going to have to show up in September with a good story about DEA and FDA <laughs> working together, and we'll plan to do that. But also, just stay in touch because uh, this is a changing epidemic, and for sure, as you clamp down on prescribing, you, you're going to see other things pop up mm -hmm. because. You have a lot of people who are addicted and, um, you know, we can't take that back. They're, they're going to have to live with it. So please stay in touch with us and we'll uh, promise to do the best job we can. Thank you. Thank you. Thank you, Thank you for being here. Thank you all for being here.